Well, I've already told you what we're looking at this morning, so let's now read the text in John chapter 11. John chapter 11. This is one of those uh, passages that is somewhat lengthy, but yet has really one central point. So we're going to try to tackle virtually, well, not the whole chapter, but pretty much of the chapter in this one sitting. What I'd like to do is read for you verses 1 through 46. Uh, I will make reference to some of these things in, in the sermon, but I won't be quoting the whole passage again throughout the sermon. It's just going to be too, too lengthy. So I, I think it'll, it'll work well. So let's focus on what it's saying here so we get the story in our minds and then I'm going to pick and choose from the different elements to draw out certain points. So this is what John writes regarding the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, particularly to Lazarus and his family in raising Lazarus from the dead and proving to us that he is in fact what he says, the resurrection and the life. Beginning in verse 1, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sister sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. This he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Therefore Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him, that is with Christ, not with Lazarus. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been dead, or had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even He who comes into the world. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying, Secretly, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to Him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met Him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house, excuse me, Then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, 
Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So when the Jews, uh, so the Jews were saying, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man also from dying? So Jesus, again being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out, cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings. And his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Again, I told you a lengthy text, but uh, uh, I think the Lord has, again, many things in here that will be very helpful for us. Now we've already seen in the last chapter that Jesus is the only door to God's kingdom. He, as we saw, is a one-way door, thankfully. Once we enter through him by faith, we will never have to leave. Nobody can break down the door and take us out, and, and the Lord's not going to kick us out. It is a position and a privilege and a blessing that we will have forever. We've also seen that Jesus is our good and faithful shepherd. He is the one who is able to provide for us here. He is the one who is able to protect us, not only while we're here, but also hereafter. And he is the one who is able to protect us from that which is most threatening, and that is death. Jesus said to us when we came to him and entered through that door, I give you eternal life, and you will Never perish. But you know, a question that we often ask ourselves is this. How do we know that this is true? Well, certainly, as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit working within us to give us the conviction that what God says in his word is true. We have faith. But the Lord hasn't left us only with this subjective assurance. He has also given to us objective proof. And he does that this morning by actually raising someone from the dead. I hope you understand this isn't just a story. This isn't a fairy tale. It isn't a legend. This is something that actually took place. Jesus actually raised a man who was dead for four days from the dead and gave him life again. Now, John includes this account in his gospel to show us one thing in particular about Jesus, the thing that perhaps is the most important thing, that he is the resurrection that he is the life. That is, that he has the authority to give life to our dead souls, as we already saw in John chapter 5, that he can and will save us from hell if we will only trust in him. He will save us from spiritual death, eternal death, judicial death in the lake of fire. But he also shows us here that he has the power to raise our bodies to life after we die. By raising Lazarus from the dead, he proves that we will live even if we die and that if we live and believe in him now, that we will in fact never die. Now this is the main thing that John wants us to see in this passage, but as I mentioned before, there are a few other things along the way that I think will also be a tremendous encouragement to us to devote ourselves to the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, first of all, I, I believe John wants us to see here that Jesus loves and cares for his people. He loves and he cares for us. Uh, we just read that Martha and Mary, when their brother Lazarus was sick and dying, sent word to Jesus. Now, why did they do that? Well, it's because they knew who Jesus was. They knew he was the Messiah. They knew he was the Son of God. They knew he was the Savior of the world. And as such, he could do something about this situation. He was the only one who really could. But more importantly, they believed that Jesus would do something about it. It's one thing to believe that he is able. It's another thing to believe that he really will do what he is able to do. They believed that Jesus would do this for, for them because they were his sheep and because he cared about them. They knew Jesus loved them. I think that's, that's interesting. I think we need to kind of point that out and consider that for a minute, that Jesus loves his sheep and that he loves them openly. That Jesus did not keep his feelings to himself but whatever he did, he always did openly. Isn't that, you know, it's kind of a wonderful thing about Jesus and an example for us as well. When Jesus needed to teach, when he needed to correct, when he needed to rebuke, he did it openly. He didn't just keep it to himself. Of course, whenever he did that, he always did it in a very gracious and charitable way. And he, he did it in the way that it needed to be done. In the case of the Pharisees, when he was calling them hypocrites, they needed to hear that in the way he said it. But also when Jesus loved someone, he also expressed that openly as well. They knew that Jesus loved Lazarus. They said in verse 3, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And they also knew that Jesus loved them. We read in verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. John is the one who's writing about this and he could see it and he knew it. Jesus loved openly. And by the way, we should also note that Jesus even cares about those that didn't necessarily love him in return. When he comes a few days later after this message that Lazarus is sick, Lord, the one whom you love is sick, would you come and do something about it? When Mary comes to him and falls at his feet weeping and he sees all the Jews that have come from Jerusalem to console Martha and Mary regarding Lazarus and they're all weeping, we see that Jesus is deeply moved and that Jesus actually weeps. He cries. He does that on occasion. He is grieved over the fact that death has brought this to the family that he loves. He's also grieving, I think, to some degree over the fact that many of these Jews who have come out, as we're going to see at the end of this passage, will not believe him, will not trust him, and will have to face judgment. Jesus had a tender heart. It was so obvious that Jesus cared that the Jews who saw him in verse 36 said, See how he loved him? Jesus has a heart that is moved with love and compassion towards his people and even, again, towards those who don't love him. He prayed on the cross, Lord, be merciful to them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, sometimes we tend to see Jesus only in his role as Lord, King, uh, Judge of the earth. And we wonder why it is that this Holy One doesn't take his rod of iron and simply strike us down for our sins. Maybe sometimes we live under that rod of judgment. And maybe sometimes, I mean, actually, we're always worthy of it. In and of ourselves, that is what we deserve. But in Christ, that's not what he gives us. We, we need to make sure we remember as well that Jesus is our elder brother, the one who cares for us. He is our Savior who died for us. He is our husband who loves us and cares for us as, as a, a man cares for his own body. Jesus loves his wife as he loves himself. He loves you if you're trusting in Jesus. He is our shepherd who lays down his life, who cares for us, who protects us. We need to remember that this is his heart towards us if we have stopped fighting against him, if we've stopped resisting him, if we've stopped rebelling against him, 
and have willingly trusted him and given ourselves to him. This is our relationship with him and that's the reason why we are here this morning and are not destroyed by his judgment. It's because of his loving kindness that never ceases toward us. They are new towards us every morning. That is what God the Father, actually the Trinity, has orchestrated for us in eternity and sent the Son into the world to accomplish that we might actually experience this kind of love, grace, and mercy. Now, as I mentioned before, too, something we don't often think about, although that may be something that would be true of, you know, perhaps our particular perspective, is that Jesus also cares about those who are, aren't his sheep. And we have several examples of that in Scripture. I already gave you one about when Jesus was crucified on the cross. He didn't call down judgment, hell and brimstone as it were, fire and brimstone from the cross and the legions of angels to destroy everyone who had just crucified him. He prayed and said, God be merciful to them. They don't know what they're doing. When he encountered the rich young ruler, after Jesus told the young man what God required of him to inherit eternal life, and the man said, Lord, I've done all these things from my youth up. Boy, what a, a self-deceived individual. Mark records this in, in uh, Mark 10, 21. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him. And you know, there are different words in the Greek for love, but this happens to be the strongest. Jesus' heart was moved by this man. It went out to him. Not because he was necessarily one of his sheep, because the man actually leaves and he doesn't follow Jesus because he couldn't let go of his possessions. But he loves him because here was a man made in the image of God. God says in Ezekiel thirty-three eleven. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. You realize that um, Jesus in Luke 19 verse 41 wept over Jerusalem because of the judgment that was coming upon Jerusalem for their rejection of him. And you know who it is that's actually prosecuting that judgment against them? It's the Lord Jesus himself. He is the one pictured coming on the clouds in judgment against them for their crucifying of him. But he's weeping for them because his heart is moved by what is going to happen to them because of their rejection of him. Now I realize that sometimes those things can seem a bit contradictory, but they aren't contradictory. There is a way that they all resolve. If we had time, perhaps we could delve into that, but we don't have time right now. Now we do need to be careful when we communicate this truth to others that we do not under, or that they don't understand us as saying or the Bible is saying that you're okay the way you are. You don't have to change. You don't have to repent. God loves you just the way you are. You have his full approval on your lives. We can't tell them that. While they still refuse to obey him, they are God's enemies. And in a certain sense, God is their enemy though he still wishes them well as we see. But they do need to understand when we come to them with the gospel that God does care and he does offer all these things to them. He offers them forgiveness. He offers them eternal life. He says that he isn't willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. And again, that is consistent with what we know about God. And that's why Jesus, when he sent his disciples out, he said, go and preach the gospel to all creation. Don't leave anyone out. Offer it to everyone because it is a sincere and well-meant offer of reconciliation to everyone who will take hold of the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, trust in him, believe in him. They will be saved if they do so. And God wants them to know that he is sincere. So let's remember that about Jesus. Jesus cares. Now the second thing we see is that Jesus' love for us does not mean that we are not going to have to face difficulties in this life, that we are not going to have to face death. As a matter of fact, Jesus' love should even make us willing to suffer and to die for him. 
Now, when Jesus heard about Lazarus, he knew that it was a part of the Father's plan to bring glory to his name by glorifying the Son through the resurrection of Lazarus. So when he heard that, he stayed where he was for two days longer. Lazarus is sick, he's dying, come Lord and heal him. Jesus stays two days longer until Lazarus was dead. Now if Jesus, Jesus had left right away, he might have been able to get there in time before that happened, he might have been able to save his life. If Jesus had just simply spoken the words and said, Lazarus as well, go back, you know, he could have done that and Lazarus would have been healed at that very moment. But that's not what Jesus did. In God's plan, Lazarus not only had to be sick, but he had to endure that sickness until it actually took his life, until he actually died so that Jesus might raise him again to life. That's the reason why Jesus delayed, was so that Lazarus would die, so that he would raise him again to life, so that he could show himself to be the resurrection and the life. Now when you think about it, the fact that Jesus actually raised Lazarus again from the dead seems like it's a mixed blessing. It's one thing to be saved from dying, but it's another to actually die, to be raised again, only so that you can die again. Most people only have to die once. Lazarus had to die twice. Now, it's especially difficult, I think, for Lazarus when you consider where he was for those four days. I mean, where was he? He was in heaven. He was in paradise, and he had to come back into this world, which is the closest thing to hell that we're ever going to experience. This is not a world full of great blessing. I mean, there are blessings here, but there's a lot of struggles. There's a lot of difficulties. Lazarus had to come back and endure this again and then suffer and die again. Now, there is one benefit, I think, to him personally, actually two benefits. One is that he'll, of course, be rewarded for having done this. But the other is if Lazarus ever struggled with assurance, <laughs> he didn't struggle anymore because he knew where he was and he knew where he was going for the rest of his life and he was looking forward to it. By the way, we should look forward to that as well because if we're trusting Jesus, that's where we're going and that's where we're going to be and we can know it just as certainly as Lazarus. But you know what? Um, the fact that he had to go through this doesn't mean that he didn't love Lazarus. And when we have to go through difficulties, it doesn't mean that he doesn't love us. Jesus loved Lazarus, but he put Lazarus through these difficulties. And I believe that Lazarus went through these things gladly and would have gone through them again and again if he had to because he loved his Lord. If we had time, we'd look at the example of the Apostle Paul and everything he endured for the sake of Christ, all the beatings and stonings and shipwrecks and, and hunger and exposure, all these things. And basically, when he looked at his body that was full of scars, beaten and bruised and so forth, he said, I'd gladly do it again. I glory in the fact that I have received this abuse that was meant for the Lord Jesus. I believe Lazarus would have done it as well. John actually gives us another example of one who was willing to do this for Jesus in this passage. When the disciples see that Jesus is intent on going back to Judea, realizing that the Jews lately wanted to kill him, we read in verse 16, Therefore Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Now did Thomas have a death wish? Well, in a certain sense, he did. Uh, as every true believer realizes that it's, it is a blessing, it is an honor to lay down your life for Christ. Hey, if Jesus is going to go there and put his life at risk, if they're going to kill him, let's go and let's die with him. Now this, I believe, is the kind of devotion that the Lord wants us to have, to be devoted to him in this way, this willingness to follow Jesus no matter what the cost may be to us personally. And I honestly believe that unless we can find this kind of devotion, to be willing to pay this kind of price, by His grace, we're not going to be as effective in the Lord's service, in doing His will, in advancing His kingdom as we might otherwise be 
unless we're willing to pay this price. Now let's not forget, again, why the Lord and His plan brings these difficulties into our lives. It's so that we might honor Him. God didn't create us and put us into this world for our own comfort, so that we could just do what we want to do and get as much fun as we can have, going around only once in this world until we finally have to die and give up all the fun. That's not why we're here. He actually brought us here so that we might honor Him. That's the reason why we were born. That's the reason why we were redeemed. And sometimes serving the Lord in this way means that we have to suffer. Sometimes it means that we may actually have to die. But if it means that, we do need to remember two things. First, as Christians, we never die. We never really die. When Lazarus died, he only fell asleep. Remember, Jesus said he's sleeping. His body looked like it was sleeping, but his soul was in heaven, and he was doing quite well. As a matter of fact, the best he had ever done in his entire life. And the same thing would be true of us when we die. We also know that Jesus is going to come one day again for our bodies, and he's going to raise them from the dead, and then we will be with the Lord forever, soul and body. Don't be afraid of death. Jesus has overcome death. But the second is, don't forget too, the Lord has promised a reward if you are willing to suffer for him. Whatever you have to endure, whatever you have to suffer, the Lord will reward you for it with a reward, the only reward, that you actually get to keep forever. I mean, you can try to earn the rewards and the, and the honors of this world, but as we're reminded in Scripture, they are things that one day will blend with the dirt on the ground. They'll blend in common dust, as the hymn writer says. We don't get to keep those. They stay here. And when this world burns up, and perhaps even before it burns up, it'll be gone. But the things that we receive from the Lord, the honors we receive from in, in heaven are those we get to keep forever. So, let's not be afraid to suffer. That's something that is a part of the Christian life. We should be willing to do it out of our love for the Lord. Third, knowing that we are eventually going to die, we need to use the time the Lord has given to us wisely. Now, after Jesus waited two more days, he said to his disciples, let's go again to Judea. The disciples asked him why, considering the Jews there wanted to kill him. Jesus' answer is very instructive, and as a matter of fact, he has said this once before in verses 9 and 10. Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. Now, what is Jesus saying here? basically saying the same thing that he said earlier in John chapter 9 verses 4 and 5. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Basically what Jesus was saying was this, that even though they wanted to kill him, they knew that he would not, that they would not be able to kill him because his time had not yet come. It wasn't yet his hour. Jesus knew until that hour came, he was invincible. And nobody could take him. Nobody could really injure him. Nobody could kill him. Now, since that hour hadn't come, that meant something else was true. He still had work that he needed to accomplish. And that work was in Bethany, only two miles away from Jerusalem. So that is where he was going to go. He was going to do the Father's work while it was still day because the night was coming when he would no longer be able to work. Now again, realize the same thing is true of us. We will not die one minute sooner or later than what the Lord has actually planned for us. And until that time comes, there is nothing in this world that can possibly take our life away. So until that time comes, we need to use whatever time we have remaining for the reason that God gave us the time in the first place, that we might serve him. 
We must work the works of him who made us as long as it is day. Night is coming. Death is coming when we're no longer going to be able to work when we finally enter into rest. And as I said before, perhaps not in the sermon, but in, in the prayer, this is the only opportunity we have to serve the one who has done so much for us. He is taking care of us here. He's going to take care of us in heaven. This is the only service that we offer to him in which there's really any threat involved. That's what we do here. So the one in which we have to pay the highest price. But he is worthy. He is worth it for us to do this. And that's what we need to purpose to do. That is what Jesus is teaching his disciples. That's what he's teaching us. And let's not forget the rewards for doing this are great. Well, finally, we come to the main point of the passage. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He now proves this by raising Lazarus. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. Even though Lazarus had been dead for four days, she still believed that there was hope. And I know this can be a little bit confusing, but I believe we have to see that in this text. In verses 21 through 22, she says to him first, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Well, certainly that's true if Jesus willed to heal him, but he could have healed him where he was. But look at what she says secondly. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Now, why does she say that? I think it's because she had some hope that Jesus was going to raise him from the dead. Now, what follows after this almost sounds like Martha doesn't believe that, but I don't really know how we can understand this in any other way. So I think that Jesus was testing Martha here. Now, Jesus knew what Martha wanted to raise her brother again to life, but he also wanted this to be a blessing to her and a benefit to her. So he used it to test her and to prove her faith he puts her to the test and first of all he tells her that her brother will rise again and she humbly says that she knows that he will on the last day she believed in the resurrection she knew Jesus loved Lazarus she knew that he would be a part of that resurrection on that last day but at the same time she was hoping that day wouldn't be quite so far off for Lazarus because the one who could raise the dead on that day, the one who was going to raise the dead on that day, was standing right in front of her. And Jesus, of course, doesn't disappoint her. He says to her in verses 25 and 26, which is again the core message of this passage, I am the resurrection and the life. By the way, what gave the disciples the courage to go with Jesus to Judea? But the fact that they believed this was true as well. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asks Martha, do you believe this? And she says, yes, I believe. I believe that you are the Christ. I believe you are the Son of God. I, am really, I believe that you are the one who is to come into the world. Well, she believes. And so Jesus is going to, as we know in Scripture, he doesn't do his miracles in the face of unbelief, but according to your faith, let it be done. And, and so he goes now to raise Lazarus. But first he calls for Mary, and then Mary comes, and then the Jews come with Mary, thinking that she's going to the tomb to weep there. And when they arrive, Jesus says something that's unexpected, perhaps to Mary, perhaps to the rest of the Jews, but not to Martha, Remove the stone. Well, of course, Martha points out something which seems to indicate a lack of faith. Lord, by now, he stinks. There's a stench. I mean, four days, dead. It's got to smell pretty, pretty terrible. But Jesus said to her in verse 40, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? I think we see a mixture of faith and unbelief in Martha. But yet we know that she believes that God will give to Jesus whatever he asks. So they remove the stone. Jesus then looks toward heaven and he says in verses 41 and 42, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But because of the people standing around me, I said it so that they may believe 
that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus <laughs> obeyed. The spirit of life returned to his dead body. He stood up. He came out of the grave. I'm not sure exactly how he came out of the grave because he was all wrapped up with these you know, grave claws, windings around his, his feet. He was bound. Even around his face, he couldn't even see where he was going, but yet he found his way to the entrance because of the command of Jesus that brought life back into his body. Jesus then says, unbind him. Take the wrappings off and let him go. This shows us that Jesus has authority over the greatest enemy of, our, of, 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 of us, basically, death. The fact that he raised Lazarus from the dead proves that what he says is true. He is the resurrection and the life. Jesus says, he who believes in me will live even if he dies. What he means is if we believe in Jesus, even though one day we will still die, that is our bodies will go into the grave, we will live again. Our bodies will be raised when Jesus returns. The second part, I think, is perhaps even more encouraging because it tells us what happens to our souls after we die. In verse 26, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And by that, Jesus doesn't mean it, that all of us here today aren't going to die and have our bodies put in the grave. But what it means is that when we die, our souls will continue to live with the Lord in glory. As Paul was contemplating his own death, he says to depart and be with Christ. That is very much better than remaining on in this life. Paul says when our bodies are torn down, we have a dwelling not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. To depart from the body, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And there we will be with him until he returns to raise our bodies on that last day when he raises the dead, when he speaks with that authority that, that raised Lazarus and the tombs empty out. Jesus has taken the sting out of death for us if we are trusting him. Death will not be able to hold us in the grave. We will not be condemned on judgment day. We will not perish in hell forever but we will live forever with the Lord in paradise between now and his second coming and afterwards when he makes all things new, we will live with him forever in the new heavens and the new earth. That is a blessing that the Lord has given to us through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ if we have received this Savior, if we have turned from our sins, if we are following him, if we are devoted to him in the same way that Lazarus and Thomas we're devoted to him. Again, not perfectly devoted to him. And there are varying degrees of this, but it's in our heart. That's what we want, it's what we desire, and that's what we strive towards. Now, if you haven't trusted the Lord this morning, lastly, the good news is the Lord says that he will do these same things for you. He will grant to you these same blessings if you will simply receive him. If you simply trust him. Look to him, believe on him, turn away from your sins and follow him. You know, there's only two possible responses to the gospel, to the offer, the free offer of the gospel. You either believe it and receive him or you don't do it. And we see that that's exactly what happens at the end of this text. We read in verse 45 that there were many who saw the miracle and they believed we read, therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what Jesus had done, what he had done, believed in him. They were now safe. They were now the children of God. They were now a part of the first resurrection, and they would never die. But we have to notice as well, there were also those who saw, who didn't believe, which reminds us, of course, that miracles can't convert you only the Lord by His Spirit can. We read in verse 46, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Was it because they were excited about it? They wanted the Pharisees to know too, oh look here, the person you really care about, the one you believe, the Messiah has done these things? Well, only if they want to be thrown in prison. 
They were going to the Pharisees because they hated Jesus and they wanted to fuel the fire for the Pharisees to kill him. Now, if you don't believe in Jesus, what's going to happen to you is going to happen is the same thing that, that happened to these Jews if, if they continued not to believe. You'll eventually die because everybody's going to die, but you'll be a part of the second death. If you're not a part of the first resurrection, you will go down into hell. So again, there's a choice set before you this morning, life and death. Which are you going to choose? If you haven't already chosen life, realize he offers you life again this morning. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, as uh, Paul and Silas said to the Philippian jailer, and you will be saved. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. You just simply need to receive his offer of forgiveness. Look to Jesus. Turn from your sins. Follow Jesus and you will live. Let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply what we've just heard.